the librarian liaison here at the University of Maryland to the School of Public Policy, Department of Government and Politics, and the newly renamed, and what a wonderful new name it is, Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. I want to thank you all for attending, and special thanks to our speakers, whom I will be introducing shortly. This session is part of an ongoing series of interdisciplinary dialogues the UMD libraries have been organizing since 2015. Drawing upon faculty and staff from a variety of departments and offices on campus, these dialogues have explored such diverse issues as immigration, sex and gender in academia, social media and elections, and income inequality. Our next interdisciplinary dialogue is on Wednesday, November 18th from three to four, and it is the tale of two pandemics, illuminating structural racism and COVID. So this is our first Zoom forum. And since it is our first Zoom forum, there are a couple of housekeeping things that have already been mentioned, but I'll mention them again. Please everyone, if you're not a presenter, stay muted and turn your video off. And we ask that you hold your questions to the end and then post them in chat. And we will get to as many of those questions as we can. Today's event occurs at a monumental time. It is being held one week before an election that might be one of the most important in our history, one in which the women's vote could very well play a decisive role. It is offered in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the measure that made that possibly decisive vote role possible, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which provided that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The passage of the 19th Amendment is one of the most consequential events in US history. And I'm sure everyone is aware, the measure did not automatically make all women equal citizens. Women of color in particular still faced formidable barriers to voting for many years. And even today, not all Americans can vote easily. Nevertheless, the political landscape in the US has been transformed in the 100 years the 19th Amendment was approved. Today, 127 women are members of the US Congress, including 26 senators. This is about 24% of the total membership, not a full share, but a meaningful one and one that is increasing. Similar representation can be found in state assemblies and statewide elective offices. And in 2020, only two elective offices have not been held by women in the US. And maybe that will change next week. Our four speakers drawn from four different departments at the University of Maryland will speak about various aspects of women's suffrage and political involvement. And following the main presentations, we have a curator from the library's special collections who will offer a brief introduction to an upcoming exhibit. And I will introduce each speaker just before she speaks and we're going in alphabetical order. And again, please everyone, if you could stay muted and off your video and hold your questions to the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Jessica Enoch, Professor of English and Director of the Academic Writing Program at the University of Maryland, where she also teaches courses in rhetoric, writing, and feminist memory studies. Her recent publications include Domestic Occupations, Spatial Rhetorics and Women's Work, and co-edited titles, Mestizia Rhetorics, an Anthology of Mexicana Activism in the Spanish Language Press, 1887 to 1922, Women at Work, Rhetorics of Gender and Labor and Retellings, Opportunities for Feminist Research in Rhetoric and Composition Studies. The title of her presentation is Suffrage Memory and the 2020 Election. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see you all. Um, I really appreciate everybody putting this together and, I, and I'm excited to hear the rest of our panelists. I didn't realize we were going in alphabetical order. So I was kind of hoping I was gonna hear some other people before I kicked off. So, so nice to see you. Um, okay, so I do have a, um, I'd like to share the screen. So I don't know if you all, if, if that is enabled for me, there we go. Okay. Um, Sorry, just one second, it just disappeared behind my, my screen. Just one second, there we go. Ah, sorry, 
Okay. There, I said, I'm like, I've got this and now, where is it? There we go. Okay. So I'm just, this will, there we go. All right. So thanks everyone. Um, so today I wanted to talk about um, a book project that I'm working on that has to do with suffrage memory and um, how that, how the centennial is emerging and how we're remembering it in contemporary society. I'm sorry, I do have a dog and three kids who are all running around. I'm just going to make sure this door is shut before I thought I was going to have a minute to hop up. Okay. Apologies. Okay. Um, so my comments are drawn from my current book project, which approaches the election year from a slightly different angle, and that is one of public memory. And my project titled Remembering Suffrage, Feminist Memory, and Activism at the Centennial of the 19th Amendment brings together and examines commemorations dedicated to this anniversary and reads memorializations from the perspective of feminist memory studies and rhetorical studies. So here I investigate the suffrage memories that have been and continue to be recovered throughout the centennial year and analyze the way these memories are put to use to speak to present day concerns in context. And I'm gonna talk for just a minute about the book as a whole and then spend my short time um, considering how this project speaks to our election concerns today. And I should also say that I'm teaching a class this semester on the suffrage centennial and public memory. And so we're actually the readings I'm bringing up today are ones that we're talking about. We talked about yesterday and we'll talk about again tomorrow. Um, and so I've been really impressed with how my students have engaged these questions. So it's been a really fun semester so far, even in this strange environment that we're in. Okay, so to the book. Um, remembering suffrage builds from major tenant of public memory scholarship. So it's how those in the present memorialists today call up the past, how they remember and for what reasons. So um, we use and shape our memories to speak to present day concerns and public memory is an argument for the past we revere and for the present and futures we want to realize. So those are the tenets that I'm kind of thinking about as I'm working on this project. Remembering suffrage thus explores how concerns of 2020 activate suffrage memori memorializations and how memorializations are crafted to shift and contour our socio-political landscape. So the main questions that I'm interested in are which suffrage past is presented to present day audiences, who is remembered, how and within what context, how is this recovered past made relevant to present day audiences and what arguments or claims are being made about the past and present and how and in what way is the suffrage past setting pace for feminist activism in the present and future. So here um, are some of the commemorative projects I've been examining this year and I'd be interested if people have seen them. Um, I would see there's some popular books and some children's books, documentaries, plays, and musicals, exhibits when we used to be able to go to museums, um, podcasts, as well as monument installations and monument and art installations. So I can talk about how my project has changed shape due to the pandemic too, if people are interested. But for the purposes of today's conversation, I wanna focus on how memorialists connect the centennial to the 2020 election. And my concern here is to explore and catalog because I'm still in the middle of, I was just like culling more resources this morning of how memorialists are using the centennial to frame and make arguments about voting practices and voting rights, as well as women's election to public office. So the specific question I'm asking here are, is in what ways are, well, these are the questions, in what ways are people connecting suffrage concerns to election concerns? Um, and I'm interested in thinking about what comes out of this connection. That is by interfacing these two concerns, what are memorialists emphasizing about both the suffrage movement and today's electoral moment? What arguments are made possible through the connection between the past and the present? So let me give you a sense of the scope of the connections people are making. Um, we see here arguments that leverage the suffrage centennial as an impetus for people to vote, um, to con to consider um, issues of labor rights, to identify the ERA as a consideration this year when electing national, state, and local officials. Um, and then we also see arguments about voter restrictions and voter suppression. And I'd like to spend a few minutes on the connections memorialists have made um, between the suffrage movement and the selection of Kamala Harris as Joe Biden's vice presidential running mate. So here we see four headlines that couple Harris's nomination and the suffrage movement. And I'd like to focus on just one, and we could talk about all four if you'd like. Um, 
because it, like many others, not only marks the anniversary, but it complicates it. And through the complications, some compelling arguments are made about what we should be thinking about when we're considering our, this electoral moment. Um, before we dig in though, I wanna back up a minute. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know this already, but I just wanna make sure this point is clear to say that one of the many um, issues that suffrage memorialists have had to consider is the movement's racism and exclusionary tactics. So for as many of you know, black women were routinely excluded from suffrage activism as well as many women from many cultural backgrounds with white suffragists such as Susan B. Anthony and um, Carrie Chapman Catt courting the Southern vote by overtly expressing racist ideology. Catt, for instance, infamously stated that white supremacy will be strengthened, not weakened by women's suffrage. So given this concern regarding suffrage memory, what happens when memorialists connect Harris, a woman of black and Indian heritage to suffrage commemoration? So when we look at this article, and I can stop sharing here because we're just, I'm not gonna show it to you specifically. I wanna talk about how authors Barry and Gross begin by citing the importance of this moment. They write that for the first time, a black woman is the presumptive nominee of a major party ticket. And this nomination becomes 100 years after women gained the right to vote. But the suffrage centennial is not the only anniversary that resonates and echoes through this moment. They make this point clear. They cite that this year is also the 55th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. And in doing so, they link suffrage, white women's activism, as many people um, remember, with black activism and the civil rights movement. Barry and Gross then spend the majority of the essay excavating the legacy that paved the way for Harris. This is the point that they want to make um, most exclusively. And importantly, it's not Anthony and Stanton they invoke as Harris's foremothers, but black suffragists, activists, and political leaders like Sojourner Truth, Henrietta Purvis, Charlotta Bass, um, Alice Presto, Mary Church Terrell, Barbara Jordan, and Shirley Chisholm. And the, cover the conversation goes past 1920 to talk about Black women's activism around voter registration, education, and suppression from 1920 to today. And the writers overtly engage the, the quote, pushback and harsh criticism Black women of the past and present, women like Maxine Waters, Barbara Lee, and Harris herself have received have received from, quote, people who are still not comfortable seeing black women in positions of power. So finally, I wanna point out that Barry and Gross build a legacy of black women's suffrage and political activism that does not lie dormant in the past. Rather, their legacy, the legacy that they um, build becomes exigent for present day work. The writers encourage readers to be vigilant in beating back voter suppression to stop police brutality and to seek justice in cases like Breonna Taylor, as well as to fight quality, fight for quality healthcare, housing, and education for all black women. So I want to conclude by circling back to these questions I posed a minute ago. This is just a quick <laughs> um, view of what's going on right now in terms of the election and the centennial. But just to think about how certain present day moments are um, energizing and catalyzing conversations that we might not have had. So through Harris, we're having these conversations, of course, about Black women's activism and the activists who've come before her. Um, but those questions that we asked were, how are memorials connecting suffrage concerns to election concerns? And by interfacing these two concerns, what are memorialists emphasizing about the suffrage movement in today's electoral moment? And so we see that Kamala's, Kamala Harris's nomination catalyzes new stories about suffrage to be told, ones that while not overtly engaging the racism of the moment, highlight not only black women's suffrage activism and political leadership, but also the discrimination and quote, pushback that they encounter. And two, by connecting Harris's nomination to the suffrage movement, we're seeing a suffrage legacy that prompts women to do more than simply vote, which is a lot of what the discourse is like, women won the right to vote, so go ahead and vote. So it's a little bit more than that here. We're seeing a legacy that prompts women to do more than this and to prioritize concerns of vital interest to the black community, such as police brutality and black women's health and education. So by placing Harris's nomination and the centennial in conversation, a specific and distinctive set of prerogatives are put in play for voters. And my work in the book and what I've really been interested in with my class is to explore these varied ways that the, separate, the centennial is leveraged and touched upon and recast to, to address this current moment. So I'm excited to talk with you all about that today. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful.
Our next speaker is Robin Muncie, Professor of History. Professor Muncie specializes in 20th century US history, particularly women's history and the history of social policy and progressive social movements. She's the author of Creating a Female Dominion in American Reform, 1890-1935, and Relentless Reformer, Josephine Roche, I hope, and Progressivism in 20th Century America. She recently served as guest curator of an exhibit at the National Archives titled Rightfully Hers, American Women and the Vote, and this semester is teaching an undergraduate course on the struggle for U.S. women's suffrage. The title of her presentation today is Infinite Labor, American Women and the Vote. Great, thank you so much, Judy. And thank you so much, Jessica. I'm actually gonna do something that you know you just described people doing. Um, I'm thrilled to be a part of this, uh, this panel that commemorates the uh, centennial of the 19th Amendment. Uh, um, this afternoon, I want to highlight some of what the 19th Amendment immediately accomplished and what some of its limitations were as well, and Jessica and Judy have both alluded to those, as well as what the 19th Amendment teaches us about how po significant political change can happen in the United States. As Judy said, the 19th Amendment said that no state or the federal government could deny the vote on the basis of sex. And the first thing I want to highlight is the most obvious one. The amendment was a major milestone in the history of American democracy. More on that in a, in a minute. The second point is that even though it was a monumental achievement, the 19th Amendment did not enfranchise American women. That is the claim that the 19th Amendment enfranchised American women made so often, and especially by historians, is inaccurate. And third, I hope to, to uh, send the message that the movement that produced the 19th Amendment, usually called the women's suffrage movement, was at its height a multiracial, multi-ethnic, cross-class mass movement. All of these points have important lessons for us today, as Jessica imagined, I would say, uh, and uh, I'll elaborate briefly on each. First, the 19th Amendment was a major milestone in the history of American democracy. It was a major milestone in part because it resulted in the immediate fuller enfranchisement of somewhere around 25 million American women, remarkably expanding the US electorate. In fact, the 19th Amendment occasioned the largest single expansion of the electorate in all of US history, bringing the country closer to its purported ideal of a government based on the consent of the governed. The ramifications of this vast expansion of the electorate for American politics and policy continue to reverberate today. Since 1964, for instance, women have usually outvoted men and a gender gap in presidential elections opened up in 1980. These voting patterns in turn produce policies that structure our individual lives. And we continue to watch the meanings of the 19th Amendment unfurl as record numbers of women are now serving in Congress, as has been alluded to already. The Speaker of the House of Representatives is a woman and the vice presidential candidate of the Democratic Party is too. The legacy of this amendment for our own lives is profound and constantly unfolding. For all the significance of the 19th Amendment, however, it is inaccurate to say that the 19th Amendment enfranchised American women. It is inaccurate because millions of women had the vote before the 19th Amendment, and as Jessica said, millions of women were still denied the vote after the 19th Amendment. If we miss this point, we misunderstand how political change happens or doesn't and we become less effective citizens. This is why we need to understand that before 1920, millions of American women already exercised full voting rights and many millions more enjoyed voting rights in at least presidential elections. These millions of ballot wielding women had won the vote through measures taken by their states which according to the original US constitution had exclusive power to decide who voted. Not until the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870 did the federal government in any way curtail the freedom of the states to decide who votes. The 15th Amendment, you'll recall, was a post-Civil War amendment that prohibited the states from denying the vote on the basis of race. But other than that, the states remained free to enfranchise or disfranchise whomever they wished. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, 
millions of women were enfranchised by their states. Indeed, in the West, almost all the states had enfranchised women on the same basis as men before the 19th Amendment, as had New York and Michigan. When I say on the same basis as men, I mean that women had the same eligibility requirements for voting and they voted in all the same elections that men did. Moreover, several states in the East and Midwest and even the Upper South had enfranchised women at least in presidential elections before the 19th Amendment was ratified. The upshot was that millions of women exercised the vote before 1920, and indeed in the election of 1920, more than half of presidential electors would have been elected in part by women, even if the 19th Amendment had not been ratified. Men in Congress and state legislatures, of course, took note as more and more of them were elected by women as well as men, and the presidential candidates of their own political parties were elected in part by women, the votes in Congress for the federal amendment to the US Constitution increased. It was indeed because so many women were already voting that men in Congress were more likely to vote for the amendment and send it to the states for ratification. Another way to say this is that the 19th Amendment represented in large part the existing electoral power of American women. Hard won local victories achieved by grassroots efforts over generations, eventually accumulated to make a national victory possible. This is how significant political change happened in the case of women's suffrage. If we say that the 19th Amendment enfranchised American women as though the deed was done in one fell swoop, we obscure all those generations of successful grassroots activism that actually made the amendment possible. Just as millions of women already had the vote before the 19th Amendment, so were millions still excluded from the polls after 1920. Women in Puerto Rico, for instance, remained disfranchised because the amendment said that no state or the federal government could deny the vote on the basis of sex, but said nothing about the territories. Women in Puerto Rico, which was of course a territory, continued their fight for the vote until 1935, when finally all adult women in Puerto Rico could cast a ballot. Again, if we say that American women won the vote in 1920, we obscure, we erase the ongoing struggle of Puerto Rican suffragists in the 1920s and 1930s. African American women in Southern states also remained largely excluded from the, from the polls in 1920. They were excluded by the same measures that widely disfranchised African American men since the early 20th century, including the poll tax, unfairly administered literacy tests, threats of economic reprisals from employers, and brute violence. Still, Southern Black women protested against their exclusion in 1920, and they continued their voting rights activism from the 1920s to the present day, claiming dramatic victories in 1964 with a constitutional amendment to abolish the poll tax, and in 1965 with pass passage of the Voting Rights Act, which abolished literacy tests in places that used them to discriminate on the basis of race. For Black women in the South, the 19th Amendment became a resource in an ongoing struggle for the vote rather than the end of efforts to wield the ballot. A substantial portion of Native American women were also denied voting rights in 1920, as well as all Asian immigrant women. Struggles for the vote among these groups continued into the 1950s, and of course, for many continue today. The denial of ballots to language minorities and disabled Americans, of course, continued voting rights activism through the 20th century. And especially since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in, in 2013, Americans are once again struggling mightily over voting rights. Women remain at the forefront front of this struggle. Today's voting rights leaders include Latina labor leader Dolores Huerta, Kathy Feng and Sylvia Albert at Common Cause, Stacey Abrams, founder of Fair Fight, and Myrna Perez, director of voting rights and elections at the Brennan Center. So you can see it is simply inaccurate to say that the 19th Amendment enfranchised American women. That claim gets the meaning of the amendment wrong and obscures how political change has really happened in the case of women's voting rights. The third thing I want to highlight about the 19th Amendment is that the movement was pro that produced it was dazzlingly diverse. 
In the 1910s, when the women's suffrage movement achieved its signature successes, including the 19th Amendment, it was a multiracial, multiethnic, and cross-class mass movement. Let's use Maryland as a quick example. In 1915, middle-class African-American suffragists Augusta Chazelle and Estelle Young founded the Progressive Women's Suffrage League in Baltimore. That group became a steadfast participant in the movement for women's suffrage in Maryland. In 1919, working-class Black suffragist Martha Wheeler from rural Washington County declared herself ready to organize for the cause. She indicated that many of her friends stood at the ready as well. Working class white women who were members of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union in Baltimore worked for suffrage in the teens. And um, Anna Gaventer, a garment worker from Baltimore, was among those who picketed the White House in the late 1910s. She was arrested and served 30 days for her commitment to the cause. Middle class white suffragists, both urban and rural, organized local suffrage associations, such as the Just Government League, and participated in national suffrage events, not only picketing the White House, but parading in DC and testifying before Congress on behalf of the federal amendment. By the 1910s, the women's suffrage movement across the United States mirrored the movement in Maryland. Black and white women, Native American women, Asian descended women and Latinas, working class women from California to Massachusetts, immigrants and queer women, all participated avidly in the struggle for women's enfranchisement. As Jessica has said, there were terrible tensions and open conflicts among these varied women, but their combined efforts nevertheless produced the most important victories of the women's suffrage movement. Building a diverse mass movement was what it took to win the signal successes of the women's suffrage movement. And we need to know this because the struggle of our voting rights has not ended. The suffrage struggle is our struggle. By grounding ourselves in the history of this movement, we can become more effective participants in it. We will know that the movement for voting rights among women has been consistently organized at the grassroots level over the course of generations. And that at two points, the 1910s and the 1960s, those scattered grassroots efforts coalesced into multiracial cross-class mass movements that produced sweeping change at the national level. This is one of the ways that significant political change can happen in the United States persistence in struggle and patching together diverse coalitions. If we want to be effective democratic citizens, we would do well to take those lessons to heart. Thank you. Thank you, that was wonderful too. Boy, so much food for thought from Jessica and Robin already and more to come. Our third speaker is Linda Steiner, Professor of Journalism. Professor Steiner has co-edited a number of books, including most recently and most relevantly, Front Pages, Front Lines, Media and the Fight for Women's Suffrage. She has served on numerous campus diversity committees and on the President's Commission on Women's Issues. She is also director of UMD's Advanced Program, which works to support the recruitment, retention, advancement, and professional growth of a diverse professorate and promotes an inclusive work environment for all UMD faculty members. Today, she will examine suffrage periodicals in a presentation titled, Was the Real Goal Getting the Vote? Thank you. So um, I'm going to take up some of the same questions, but from a slightly different perspective and really uh, take on the question about what we mean by politics and political activity and um, use that to question the extent to which the goal was really getting the vote and, and being able to vote or certainly actual voting as opposed to something else. And um, I think that part of the commemoration, I don't know if this is something that Jessica also noticed, but I saw a lot of people 
around the time of the uh, days of the ratification 100 years ago, when we were commemorating this, asking the question, well, why were women so unprepared to do something with a vote once they could vote? Um, why weren't they more prepared with agendas and with candidates? And, and even why didn't women vote in larger numbers? And my answer to this is that at least if we look at the 19th century part of the women's suffrage movement, and that is what I've done, uh, and particularly by looking at the women's suffrage press in the 19th century, um, the political issue is really the issue of status. It's the question of how women could create a new vision of womanhood and then argue for that woman deserving status, deserving honor, deserving respect. And my suggestion is that the 19th Amendment was important to the women suffragists of the 19th century, not so much because they wanted to vote, but because they wanted their new visions of womanhood to have the honor, to have the respect that a constitutional amendment would signify. And I think uh, this issue is different now. I think certainly I would have to acknowledge that voting now has a very different meaning and will see what happens next week. But I think what is still worth asking is what are the other occasions when we seem to be arguing over one thing, but actually we're really arguing over something else. That something else being the status of an identity, the status of a group, the status of a lifestyle. I just wanna very, very quickly note why creating a new vision of womanhood was so important for 19th century women. Given the massive changes of industrialization, um, the concomitant move to a monetary economy, the concomitant move to smaller um, housing when people were living more in cities rather than rural areas, having fewer children, and in some sense, even having fewer uh, material responsibilities and for women having a sense that basically their role in life was decorative, that they were consumers, they were demonstrating their family's wealth and ability to consume. Um, there were certainly different responses to this. Certainly many women uh, uh, kind of embraced the new notion, which they claimed was old, but was actually new, of the true woman, the woman who really personified um, purity and a civilization, civilizing influence rather, um, her domestic virtues, her role in um, making, uh, her children well-educated and providing a nice household for her um, income earning husband to return to at the end of the day. Uh, for women suffragists, this was not uh, comforting at all. This was not satisfying. This did not confer a sense of meaningfulness. And they sought a new vision of womanhood my reading of the women's suffrage press, again, looking at kind of the 1848 to 1900 period especially, suggests that there were different versions of this new woman. So um, there are not only the conflicts that um, other speakers have already alluded to and, and spoken directly to that really emerged in the 20th century, but there were different versions of women so different that women were not even within the suffrage movement 
unified around and, and they really sort of argued about. Amelia Bloomer articulated what she called a sensible woman in the pages of the lily. And you can see the sort of feminine banner of the lily. Um, but this was a woman who would bicycle, who would exercise, who was practical and did the kinds of things that she needed to do to be um, effective in her community as well as in her home. Um, there were other newspapers that articulated very similar versions of the sensible woman, including the Una Paulina Wright Davis's newspaper devoted to the elevation of woman. Um, the much maligned Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, stood really shoulder to shoulder with Sojourner Truth in the um, 1850s, 60s, and 70s, uh, then, then uh, broke off after the ratification of the um, 15th Amendment. But in any case, they articulated what they called a strong-minded woman in the pages of the revolution, its motto being principle, not policy, justice, not favor. They were articulating the notion that a woman had a right to vote, regardless of whether she voted, whether she was interested in reform, regardless of um, her moral values, that by definition, the strong-minded woman who also had the right to smoke and drink alcoholic beverages and engage in free love and all kinds of other controversial things, have abortions, by the way, um, uh, deserved the right to vote as much as any man did. Uh, Lucy Stone um, found the strong-minded woman abhorrent. And in the pages of the Women's Journal, she and her uh, significant number of colleagues articulated what they called a responsible woman, much more like the sensible woman of a couple of decades earlier. Um, and a, a, a version of womanhood um, who did actually argue for women's kind of reforming influence and argued much more that women deserve the vote and deserve status as political beings because of what they could do with it, not as a matter of principle. Um, and then fourthly, I want to point out um, the version of the respectable black woman that was artic articulated by the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Um, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, was one of the uh, founders of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And she um, in particular formed a group that was first local and then went national called the Women's Era and it had uh, the Women's Era's clubs um, with a newsletter that uh, went national for a few years between 1894 and 1897. So um, sort of echoing uh, Evelyn Higginbotham's notion of the politics of black respectability, the women's era argued that black women again would stand shoulder to white women with white women um, as respectable women who um, sort of follow the dictates of etiquette. The women's era not only commended Lucy Stone and the women's suffrage movement and denounced, by the way, temperance leaders as, as hypocrites, but also had recipes and it had um, articles about etiquette and the importance of having calling cards when one went to visit one's um, sister suffragists. Um, so I think the point to be made here is that uh, in some sense, all of this is an unfinished and ongoing story. 
partly because status is never complete. It always has to be protected. It always has to be demanded. Um, as soon as the women's suffrage movement was, uh, excuse me, the um, women's suffrage amendment, the 19th amendment was ratified. Susan um, B. Anthony um, was kind of out of it and, and the responsible women were not the women who actually won that um, major sort of premier priority status. Um, but the, the, the responsible woman articulated by Lucy Stone um, immediately went on to the ERA, um, their sort of next hurdle for acknowledgement of their lifestyle and their vision of womanhood as, as um, being the one that really ought to be respected and ought to be celebrated and ought to be advocated. So um, it is an ongoing story and um, feminists will fight this battle in, in other ways. Thank you, another wonderful presentation. And our final panelist is Carly S. Woods, Associate Professor and Co-Director of Graduate Students in the Department of Communication and also affiliate faculty in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies. Her book, Debating Women, Gender, Education and Spaces for Argument, 1835 to 1945 was published in 2018 and has garnered several notable awards. Her presentation today is titled Debating Women, Voting Women. Share my screen there. All right, so thank you so much for that kind introduction and also um, a special thanks to uh, Antonia Huntenberg for uh, co uh, all the emails coordinating the panel. Um, I'm especially glad to be on this panel with our moderator, uh, Judy, because uh, as women's studies librarian, uh, Judy Markowitz helped my class, guided my class in uh, spring 2020. Uh, it was the rhetoric of gender activism and they completed some pretty complex genealogical and archival research um, as they tried to study uh, little known suffragists. Uh, in an activity that I know Jess Enoch and Robin Muncy have also done with their classes. Uh, they were to write thousand word bio sketches about these little known suffragists um, and the best of the bunch were published or are about to be published in the online biographical dictionary of the suffrage movement in the United States. As one of my students put it, um, that thousand word bio sketch ended up being one of the hardest but ultimately uh, most rewarding research project of their entire college career. Um, so I'm grateful to Judy and also UMD libraries for all of the support you provide for students and faculty, especially during the pandemic. Um, in terms of research, my way into today's topic um, is a little circumspect because I don't study uh, suffrage per se, uh, but I do study the history of debating women. That is how women have historically used the vehicle of debate and argumentation as a means to pursue education, politics, and social change. And this is a topic that intersects in really interesting ways with suffrage, as you might imagine. Uh, allow me to offer just a few examples of what debating women can teach us about voting rights. In the 19th century, women formed debating societies as a way to address formal and informal exclusions in public life. Perhaps unsurprisingly, women's suffrage was a popular topic of debate. For example, the Ladies Edinburgh Debating Society claims the distinction of being the first debating society in Scotland to debate suffrage. And they debated the topic uh, six times between 1866 and 1918. And sometimes the majority voted with the affirmative and sometimes the majority of women voted with the negative. Despite the fact that women were not formally permitted to attend Scot Scottish universities until 1892. 
In the United States, uh, Oberlin College admitted black and white women starting in the 1830s. They claim the distinction of the first woman co college women's debating society in the United States. And yet this origin story is really complicated because women students at Oberlin were not allowed to speak in classroom debates. They had to serve as audience members uh, for their male counterparts. And this didn't go over very well. And so as the story goes, Lucy Stone, who you see here on the left side of your screen, uh, and Antoinette Brown Blackwell founded a debating society for women in the woods behind the campus. Now here's how James P. McKinney described Lucy Stone after meeting her at Oberlin College in 1847. And it's great that uh, Linda already was talking a little bit about uh, Lucy Stone. Quote, she was a frequent caller at the public library, writing voluminous notes in preparation for her essays and debates in the literary societies where she stood without peer among the men as well as the woman. On the subject to which she devoted her life, the equality before all, and in the law, her arguments were compact, logical, and unanswerable then and now. One incident I well remember. There was a bright young man who, from the central part of the state who had formerly edited a country newspaper who thought he knew it all. He was anxious to answer her arguments, although he never heard her talk, and we were all anxious to see the conceit taken out of the fellow. The opportunity came in due time, and the ex-editor met Lucy on the suffrage question. He boasted beforehand that he was double loaded to the muzzle with arguments to prove it would wholly unsex women to go to the polls and vote with men, but to most students at the time it did seem very much out of place. Lucy walked out upon the plat platform with a smile upon her face, stated clearly and concisely the objections of the gentleman, and then in witty, witty logical, and eloquent language riddled his arguments. When she took her seat, she was cheered and congratulated by all. The next morning, all who had not been present wanted to know of the editor how he came about with his unsexing arguments. He replied that he made his speech and he congratulated himself that he had settled the perplexing women question, but that quote, little blue eyed girl in the calico gown from Massachusetts got up and by the time she talked five minutes, she not only had my arguments unsexed, but swept them away like the shaft before the wind. He wound up saying, quote, if ever that girl reaches her 50th birthday, American women as well the, as the women of the world were owned, will owe her a debt of gratitude they can never repay. So Lucy Stone did reach her 50th uh, birthday, and some would say that we uh, do owe her a, grat a gratitude. She, of course, would go on to be a prominent orator, a, an abolitionist, a suffragist, parting ways with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony in her support for the 14th and 15th Amendments, which granted the, vote, the, the right to vote to Black men. Uh, Stone, her husband, Henry Blackwell, and Julia Ward Howe founded the American Woman Suffrage Association. To your right on the screen, you see Mary Church Terrell, also an Oberlin alum, also a debating woman there. In her autobiography, A Colored Woman in the White World, Church Terrell recounts how she was twice selected to represent her debating society in a public debate, once in a showcase debate before commencement, which was a crowning achievement for women's uh, students at Oberlin's, in Oberlin's literary societies. She credits this experience with her knowledge of parliamentary procedure, which she would go on to use in all of her club leadership. And moreover, she said, quote, the society gave her the ability to uh, speak effectively on her feet. She went on to be the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, a founding uh, member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and a leading voice in the uh, call for the end of segregation in DC. She picketed Woodrow Wilson in the White House with Howard University's uh, Delta Sigma Theta sorority and regularly advocated for the vote from the perspe her perspective as a black woman. Now this is all working quite well together because now I'm gonna quote from the book that's sitting behind Robin. Uh, historian Martha Jones writes in her excellent new book, Vanguard, that living at a crossroads, black women developed their own perspective on politics and power. Their view was always intersectional. They could not support any movement that separated out matters of racism from sexism, at least not for long. And so that brings us to our final uh, debating woman. And this is a, the, a person who is the subject of my, what I hope will be my next book. And that's Barbara Jordan. Uh, this is Barbara Jordan in the 1950s at Texas Southern University, a, a HBCU in uh, Houston, Texas. She was the first woman debater on the team. 
And you may know Jordan better for her statement on the articles of impeachment amid the Watergate scandal in 1974, in which she famously declared, today I am an inquisitor and hyperbole would not be fictional and would not state, overstate the solemnness I feel right now. My faith in the constitution is whole, it is complete, it is total. And I'm not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the constitution. Perhaps you might also know her from her 1976 keynote address at the Democratic National Convention. Hailing from Houston, she was the first Black woman from the South to be elected to the United States Congress. She was also a lawyer, a, an educator, and a Presidential Medal of Freedom winner. She was actually slated to give a speech at the 1995 commemoration of the 19th Amendment, the 75th uh, anniversary. Um, unfortunately, Barbara Jordan um, became very ill that year and did not ever actually give her speech. However, I went to the National Archives here in College Park and was able to find um, the speech that she, she was to give if she were to, um, to have attended that event. And as you might, uh, Imagine um, Barbara Jordan had a lot to say uh, in, uh, to celebrate the 19th Amendment. Uh, she did it, she went about it as she often did, which was to go back to the founding documents and point out that they were great but not great enough. Those words applied almost exclusively to the white males of Anglo Saxon descent who owned property on the East Coast, a change and uh, was both necessary and obvious. She also points out that women, as has been pointed out by our, our uh, panel members today, uh, were not uh, comatose during all of those years between 1776 and 1920, um, but change was indeed happening. Just as this nation could not survive half slave and half free, this democracy could not survive with the franchise extended to only one half of its citizenry. And then Jordan would have gone on to point out that uh, in addition to prominent white suffragists, we need to remember that black suffragists were always part of the conversation. And she proceeded to recite uh, Sojourner Truth's famous speech. So that was Jordan's undelivered address. Perhaps if it was delivered, it would have been remembered, it would have been circulated, but it just was not to be. But the other thing I want to point out about this debating woman, Barbara Jordan, is that she had another major accomplishment when it came to remembering voting rights, and that is that she was the per one of the people who led the charge for the extension and expansion of the Voting Rights um, Act in 1975 to include additional jurisdictions and provide protections for uh, language minorities. So as you likely know, the Voting Rights Act was signed into law in 1965. It addressed a range of discriminatory voting practices, including intimidation, violate, violence, and uh, literacy tests, all designed to uphold white supremacy. The result was nothing short of monumental, including within five months, 250,000 new Black voters were registered to vote. But as significant as it was, it didn't go far enough, especially for racial and uh, ethnic minorities seeking to vote in the United States. By the time the act faced reauthorization in 1975, it was clear that there was a lot more to do, especially in Jordan's home state of Texas. And she uh, partnered with Herman Badillo of the Bronx and Ed Roy Bell of Los Angeles to sponsor a bill that would extend and expand the VRA to provide bilingual ball ballots in areas where more than 5% of the population spoke non-English uh, languages and extend the coverage of, uh, to Mexican Americans, Alaska, Alaska Natives, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. And here on the map, you can see the light purple is where the 1975 expansion uh, affected was put into place. Her push to expand the VRA put her at odds with many of her allies, including some members of the Black Caucus who had negotiated behind closed doors with Nixon. And it also put her at odds with a lot of her allies in the state of Texas who did not like the idea of federal oversight um, in their jurisdictions. It was a hard fought battle, especially in the Senate, but ultimately her testimony and her lobbying efforts along time, alongside the testimony of uh, Latinx uh, organization activists prevailed and Ford signed it into law in August, 1975. 
According to Ari Berman, uh, the new VRA made an immediate difference. Within months of the law taking effect, the DOJ stopped a massive voter purge in Texas. The number of Mexican Americans holding county and municipal offices in Texas increased from 353 to 559 in the decade after the 1975 amendments. And city councils in America's three largest cities, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, became integrated because of the VRA. Now, 45 years after she worked so hard to expand it, I imagine that Jordan would be frustrated with the various attempts to gut the VRA, especially the 2013 Supreme Court decision in Shelby v. Holder, which effectively made federal review required under Section 5 of the Act inoperable. Indeed, just recently, there has been a large number of uh, articles about voter suppression in the state of Texas, uh, which uh, affect the vast majority of uh, the state's Black and Latinx population. If you've been watching the news, you, re you can recognize that this has uh, been a problem in many states of late. So to circle back around to contemporary politics, we might say, uh, what does all of this mean for us today? Today, there are unprecedented numbers of women-identified people running for political offices. I'll also point out there are unprecedented uh, numbers of uh, women debating in academic debate competitions at the middle school, high school, and college levels. Uh, media coverage often highlights stereotypes uh, and the challenges that women face when they're in political debates. Um, so they like to point out that Elizabeth Warren got her start on the debate team and that Hillary Clinton uh, faced challenges in presidential debates that face a lot of uh, our high school debaters in this country. This dynamic and the tightrope that they must watch, it walk is made even more clear when a debate includes a woman of color, as uh, coverage of Kamala Harris in the recent vice presidential debate showed. And of course, that was just when people weren't talking about the fly on Mike Pence's head. Uh, they were talking about Kamala Harris's facial expressions or uh, the differing views that people had about her performance in that debate. This recent NPR story shows us that those of us, something that those of us who study gender and communication have long known, gender matters in debate, uh, even when it's between two men. And that is to put it mildly, if you tuned in to this year's second presidential debate. That debate caused many people to imagine and to really fantasize about what a debate between two women presidential candidates would look like. As the comedian Sarah Cooper tweeted, no, I'm sorry, you go ahead. No, please, you. No, I cut you off. No, I cut you off. Okay, if you insist, I do. This could be a scene from the first presidential debate between two women. But I'm here to tell you today, we don't have to imagine debating women. They've always been there. They are still there today. And my research on these women from the 19th century to today tells us that debating women are trailblazers who use the vehicle of debate as a forum and a springboard to pursue po political and social change. So what should we do? We should vote if we can. We should speak out against voter suppression and discrimination based on race, based on gender, based on literacy, class, ability, and we shouldn't stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, wonderful. And before I introduce Amber Cole, I, I do have to uh, comment on two things Carly said, because one of my mottos is credit where credit is due. And I didn't say anything about my colleagues who helped put this panel together. So credit to Antonia Huttenberg, Eric Lindquist, Yelena Luckert, and uh, Lily Greiner. Thank you. Sorry for not saying it at the beginning. And the other thing I have to say, uh, thank you, Carly, for that shout out. But I know that Robin has taught that class before. And my colleagues, Eric Lindquist and Doug McElrath, did library instruction. So I stole a lot of their um, uh, resources and, and information from that class. So, OK, on to Amber Cole, who is curator of literature and rare books in special collections and university archives, who will talk about the upcoming exhibit, Get Out the Vote, Suffrage and Disenfranchisement in America. Hi, thank you. Let me share my screen. OK. So yes, I'm going to give you a kind of a little overview of the uh, what we're calling researching women in politics in special collections and university archives. 
in the context of how we put together our get out the vote exhibit. There we go. So um, first I do want to acknowledge the exhibit team, which is fortunately all women this year, which is a nice little fact. Um, first is Laura Cleary, who is the head of um, instruction and outreach here in Special Collections. Uh, myself, curator of literature and rare books. Rigby Phillips, who is a fantastic uh, student uh, um, who has a lot of interest in kind of feminism and women's rights and, and, and a lot of great stuff, as well as uh, Kimmy Remy. Um, who has graduated but helped us early on with the exhibit. So for the collections and research, um, research in the exhibit, um, we were kind of presented with a very broad theme of voting, election, and politics. That was kind of the reign we were given. Um, and given the election, um, it would be a kind of a timely topic. So we were kind of tasked with kind of narrowing down that theme a bit. Our scope was also very broad. Um, we wanted to include cross collections, a lot of different subject areas. We didn't want to limit it to just one or um, one or two collection areas. Um, and collection areas in um, special collections are just kind of subject areas that curators kind of oversee. So we have mass media and culture, um, literature and rare books, Maryland and historical collections, which you can imagine has kind of the, the bulk of, of materials that would go into the exhibit. We also have the Gordon W. Prang collection, which is Japanese language, um, World War II kind of era. Um, a labor history collection, which is a massive collection, AFL-CIO, all these different labor unions, um, as well as university archives. Um, so we really wanted to highlight a lot of different collection areas and not limit ourselves um, that way. Um, and we also have highlight some of the resources we have, and these are resources available to everyone who's kind of looking into special collections materials. First is our online catalog, which has books, published materials, um, our finding aids, which you'll see the image of on the right hand side. Um, you can search by subject um, and in various different ways, but it covers all our archival collections. Um, and the biggest resource is really the curators, um, which we, we use constantly. Um, but yeah, they're really there to help you find those kind of search tools and, and things that you might not think about searching. Um, and we also do have a ton of subject guides, particularly related to women. Um, we have uh, a, a great former um, exhibit on women in the Civil War done by Liz Navarra. So we have a lot of different kind of resources for kind of whatever your interest is in for, for women in politics. So kind of some of our women in pol politics collection, um, just on a very broad search, we have over 50 collections and I'm sure it goes even higher than 50. Um, but related to women in politics, and it's really how you interpret that, we do have um, standard politicians, what you think of women in politics. We also have organizations focused on women and also activists, artists, and writers. So there's a lot of different ways women can be engaged in politics. So it's really how you interpret that. There's a collection in the, in the archives for that um, and includes both suffrage as well as just general political engagement and involvement. Um, and the time period goes from the 18th century to the present. So um, we have, you know, uh, early editions of Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women, all the way up to, you see images there of, of women um, registering people to vote from Frontlash, which is um, the outreach kind of organization for the AFL-CIO. Um, and you'll see down there at the bottom there is um, a picture from our Juna Barnes collection. Um, who has some relation to suffrage. We have traditional rare books. The woman on the bottom left is Rosina Tucker, who was involved in labor unions early on, um, as well as you see on the right, there's uh, League of Women Voters, there's the Suffragist Newsletter, um, there's a prang um, image of, of a woman voting in Japan. So there's a lot of stuff to kind of consider when thinking about kind of women in politics. And that was kind of our first step to kind of look at everything and see what we have. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention that we do specialize in collecting Maryland political papers, um, particularly notable women, Congresswomen, uh, state legislators, local politicians, and political and civic organizations related to women. So you'll see, I just put a few highlights there um, from elected officials to non-elected officials working in politics to the organizations. And these are all focused mostly in Maryland. So they have kind of a local flavor that, um, that, that, that kind of makes us a little bit special as far as archives go. Um, and then there's also um, what we call hidden collections. So these are 
kind of places you wouldn't necessarily obviously find um, a, lot, a lot of the material. So one of the categories is just these large collections that are really tricky sometimes to search. The AFL-CIO is a massive collection um, and we rely a lot on Ben, who is the curator for the AFL-CIO archives um, and, and his staff to help us out um, searching some of that. We also have the Baltimore News American Photograph Collection, which these two photographs are actually from. Um, it's the um, uh, photo archive um, or the photo morgue for the Baltimore News American paper. And it does have a lot of images of women um, hopefully in getting yeah, suffrage as well as kind of being active in politics. Um, and then Women's Studies Pamphlet Collection is also a very broad um, collection that has a lot of different topics, not just suffrage, um, but it has a lot of different issues related to women. So that's another huge collection that you really have to search. Um, and then another one is our African and I should say Africa and African American pamphlet collection, um, which has um, your know, works by Angela Davis and another women, but it's something you kind of have to look a little bit closer to really identify. There's also things like I call the conventional male focused collections. So the Spirit T. Agnew papers, it's um, papers of the vice president and governor of Maryland, um, but there are portions of that paper that do show interaction with either women groups or other women politicians. So there are ways to kind of look in these traditional collections and find women represented in them. Sometimes it just takes a little digging to do that. Um, and then the other category I put in here because it's just like an interesting thing where you would find these, um, these sources. So I like to point out the Ferdinand Ryer papers. Ferdinand Ryer is a novelist married, his first wife was Rebecca Horowitz, Auerwitz, who was a suffragette, who was an activist. Um, and it's only by chance that I was talking to a researcher that um, we have a letter from her in the collections where she talks about missing a big march because she was getting married that day. So there's interesting like correspondence that you might not first think about, but as you start looking into the collections, um, you, you discover. And also I should point out the Barnes family papers. Um, Juna Barnes, who was a modernist writer and avant-garde artist, her grandmother was a suffragette. So we do have some material from her grandmother. So once we kind of looked at what we had and kind of took stock of, of, of what we um, could cover in the, we went about kind of creating the theme and, and, and figuring out the exhibit. So we do have some limitations and challenges, of course. Um, and as a lot of the other speakers mentioned, representing marginalized voices can be tricky in an archive. Um, you want diverse perspectives and you want to acknowledge that there might be missing voices that you cannot document with the materials you have. Um, so the challenge is how do you fill gaps of those narratives? How do you acknowledge it um, and not kind of ignore it or, or discredit it? Um, and it also brings up interesting points about addressing past exclusion in the archives. Um, you know, collections, people, stories that just were not collected. Um, how do you kind of address that moving forward? And it's something I know, considering recent times and, and the focus on trying to get more diverse collections, it's something we think more and more about in the archives. Um, and then as Rigby liked to point out, she was not expecting so many sources written, not by women, but by men. So she constantly would, throw up our hands and be like, it was written by a man. Um, so these are some of the kind of sh little limitations we have. Um, we also had a broad and expansive topic. Even voting rights is a broad topic. Women in politics, women, the 19th Amendment is a broad topic as you know, all the speakers had very different kind of um, things to focus on. Um, so how do we really do it justice? How do we really address it without kind of ignoring certain aspects of it? Um, and then the last is really creating a cohesive story. Um, given the broad range and the broad topic, how do we just make it make sense for people coming in? Um, and I should point out these two images are from an exhibit Rigby put together on intersectional feminism from the archives. Um, she did it right before the pandemic. So luckily we had it up for a little bit, um, but some of those materials actually do end up in the exhibit. So um, given these limitations and challenges, kind of what is the story we could tell with our exhibit? So we decided to look at women's suffrage kind of in the larger context of voting rights in America. Um, we wanted to highlight groups and individuals who really work towards voting rights and, and suffrage and, and getting more people access to the ballot as opposed to kind of legal, you know, um, technical um, issues. 
Um, so our focus was kind of the major achievements and as many of the speakers point out, the continuing struggles that, that continue, even if you get the 19th Amendment, it doesn't mean everyone can vote. Um, so we do highlight um, the 14th, 15th, 26th Amendment, which you know, 26th is uh, youth voting, uh, 18 and over, um, African-American, and also um, disenfranchisement um, that continued on since early voting um, and talk about Jim Crow laws, civil rights movements, and things like that, and how it is kind of a constant struggle for, for all these different groups to get access to voting. Um, and we also, for individuals, we may not have relevant materials in the archives for, as far as voting goes, we wanted to feature the individuals. So we have these featured bios in the exhibit. So Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, we have, um, who was early African-American, she was um, involved in voting rights and things. Um, but we only have a book of her poetry and it doesn't quite address, you know, voting rights, but she still is an important voice. Um, so we did want to highlight her as well as Polly Murray, who was um, oh, gender non-conforming, um, but they were um, involved in kind of activism, kind of more modern era. And um, one of the nice things from this exhibit was I was able to purchase one of their books of poetry, signed edition. So it's, you know, another thing that we now have in the exhibit or in the collections, thanks to the exhibit. Um, so that's one way we try to highlight the people, um, even if we may not have extensive primary sources on these individuals. So where we are, um, this is our lovely exhibit poster. Um, so uh, Get Out the Vote, Suffrage and Disenfranchisement in America. The online exhibit will be coming in 2020, December, hopefully. Um, the physical exhibit, because of the pandemic, has been moved back to 2021 um, to be determined. Hopefully the pandemic <laughs> doesn't get any worse. Um, but yeah, so 2021 is when we'll actually have a physical exhibit. We do have a voting rights libguide, which addresses some of the um, resources I talked about, about women in politics, talks about all, not just women's suffrage, but African-American suffrage, youth suffrage, disenfranchisement. Um, and I can provide the link to anyone who's interested in it. Um, and then we'll also have upcoming blog posts. We had a lot of great students write on particular individuals or particular items they found interesting. Um, in the exhibit or in the materials we selected for the exhibit. Um, and of course, we're always available for remote reference. So if anyone is interested in any topics, um, we are around, um, I'm around. Uh, you can always email us at askhornbake at umd.edu and we will be more than happy to help you out. That was that. Thank you. Thank you, Amber, for showing our wonderful collections. Yes. So we have about 15 minutes left and who would like to start off questions by entering a question into the chat? Do we have anybody? I'd be very surprised if we don't. Um, well, it could be while we're waiting. Do the panelists have questions for each other? Yes. <laughs> I, this is really exciting and really interesting. I loved all of the presentations here and I thank you all so much for them. Um, when Linda was talking, I was wondering if, Linda, you were looking at, I don't remember the name of the paper, but the WCTU had a, a newspaper that circulated, I think it was the, the most widely um, published women's newspaper in the 19th century. And of course the WCTU signed on to suffrage in the, in the 1880s. And I wondered if that would be a useful uh, outlet for you to look at? Well, I didn't look at it, um, but thank you for the suggestion. Um, I, I, I started out by looking at journals that really represented either primarily a suffrage um, ambition or, a, or like the Lily quickly shifted towards suffrage, although the lily began as a, as a temperance um, organ. So um, I'm glad to know there's more for me to look at. Thank you. So here's a question. Can you rephrase the problem of women's rights being pushed aside for other diverse minority populations? Can we rephrase 
this instead of an intersectionality issue, in other words, women's rights are never pushed aside, but I just considered, but are just considered in tandem with other intersectional minority voices? Anyone? <laughs> I need to repeat the, the question or? No, I, I, I can read it. I could, yeah, I don't know, Robin, do you wanna go ahead? I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't say pushed aside. I mean, I think that what, um, what I'm hoping we're, we're, we've learned from the history of um, the, the suffrage movement in the 19th and early 20th century was that white women's um, priorities took precedence in um, suffrage organizing, even though as Robin so nicely outlined and, and as, as Linda pointed out, and also as Carly did, that, that um, women of color were advocating for suffrage rights and were interested in other rights as well. Like Ida B. Wells was a suffrage organizer, but she also obviously was a huge, um, uh, um, was deeply involved in the anti-lynching campaigns. And so I wouldn't say Pushed aside, I think what I'm hoping we've, we're doing now is to see that our um, that we respond to the centennial with intersectional politics and activism, and that we see that um, no, we're not pushing aside rights, but we're thinking capaciously about the rights that are most at risk and most um, concerning. And so I think what what I'm, I mean, there's so much going on with the centennial. It's like drinking water out of a fire hydrant right now. So it's hard to say that there's like a narrative, but what I'm noticing, especially with the Kamala Harris um, connections is this investment in foregrounding black women's involvement in the suffrage movement, because we, might, we know white women's involvement very well and it's good for us to learn black women's as well. And to think about women of color, other women of color who are involved in suffrage and then to think about how their rights are um, at risk right now. I don't know, Robin, would you agree? I wouldn't say pushed aside. I feel like that that we have to, then that means we have to prioritize and that's I think so we're trying to move away from, I would think from intersectional feminism. Yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you. I was just thinking about, uh, because of something um, else I was thinking about recently, you know, there are people who have drawn such um, you know, parallels between the, say, 1913 suffrage parade in DC and the Women's March of 2017. And you know, because there are even some, images of those two, two parades that are, are from the same angle, and look down on all these women uh, marching on, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And I, you know, so they've been drawing these, con these connections between these two moments. And I have thought over and over again, oh, but they're so different and thank goodness for it because the 1913 parade um, was one that was structured so clearly by, by racism. And you know, Alice Paul was just single-mindedly thinking about a federal amendment to the US Constitution and whatever could possibly get in the way of that needed to be sidelined. And so that was a case of, a, a, it seems to me, a passionate commitment to a single, actually single measure, not even a single issue, but a single measure, a single way toward that, that meant the subordination of uh, loads of women, right? The subordination of women. It meant that there was a, a, a devotion to the federal amendment, but not actually to the enfranchisement of all women. But when you get to the 2017 Women's March and that is a march that insisted that women's rights are human rights. And that it had um, you know, diverse organizing group and the rights of immigrants, of religious minorities, of racial minorities, of course, of LGBTQ people, and of the disabled are all front and center because the organizers of that um, event saw what Alice Paul didn't, which is if you care about women, you have to care about every basis on which they can be oppressed. And that means you have to care about racism, you have to care about immigration status, you have to care, care about a whole slew of other things, not just about gender suppression. So it seems to me that the differences between those two moments are really, really significant. And I don't want to be too Pollyanna-ish, but I think you know it's really hopeful. That is a really hugely hopeful difference. Okay, I'm just taking the questions in order. So here's another one from the earlier discussion on Senator 
uh, Harris's candidacy is there an intersection between a woman, a woman of color filling the second highest office and the idea of America being post-racial? I can be quick. No, I mean, I haven't seen any connections with saying like, oh, we're post, I mean, especially after this summer in the past six months and the pandemic and how it's inflecting racially and economically, there's just, I have seen zero discussions about like, everything's fine. We've got Kamala Harris going. Um, I think that would get lost in just the, no, the very real arguments about the inequities that are going on right now, but I'll keep an eye out for that. I'll definitely keep an eye out for it, but I have not seen it uttered <laughs> yet, no. Yeah. Okay, thank you. How do conservative women memorialize suffrage? I think the other panelists could respond as well, but um, I did see some pro-life um, commemorations to the suffrage movement, which were very interesting and got a lot of um, response back to say that um, that pro-life arguments were quite different in the 1920s than they were than they are now, um, and. Um, I've seen some arguments just about voting and electing Republican women to office. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that um, certainly in the, uh, you know, there's a congressional centennial committee to, um, to uh, celebrate the centennial and Republican women as well as Democratic women were involved in that and they made speeches because the enfranchisement of women has been very important to um, to um, conservative women as well and conservative issues, uh, politics, just as it has to progressive politics. So um, I think that there's been a pretty um, visible participation of conservative women in the, the commemoration of the 19th Amendment. I would just add that I think it's interesting that the anti-suffrage women periodicals of the 19th century really acknowledged the, the status politics dimension. So they understood too and said very explicitly that the reason that women wanted to vote is because they wanted to have their way of life celebrated and again, the implication was, and that's, that's very dangerous. And um, several times there were articles in the Remonstrance and the Women's Pair Patriot, two of the best known anti-suffrage periodicals saying, and as soon as these women get the vote, then they're gonna want to uh, go on to um, birth control, which in fact was actually in some sense quite correct. Um, and so I think um, the other point I would make is that now when we see um, conservative women commemorating the, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, they're also commemorating and sort of remembering to Jessica's point, a, a more conservative version of the woman who got the vote in 1920 and sort of forgetting the radical dimensions that sometimes were articulated quite clearly, again, in publications like The Revolution. Can you talk a little about the extent of male involvement in the suffrage movement? I am familiar with the extent of white involvement in the abolitionist and civil rights movement, but realize I don't really know the extent of male involvement in the push for women's rights. Carly's shaking her head, yes. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, the men were involved. Uh, certainly the Men's League for Suffrage, um, Frederick Douglass, uh, perhaps the most famous uh, su su male suffragist. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really fascinating um, research out there about uh, allyship within this movement um, that I think could be explored. I'm not as familiar with how it is being commemorated this year, so maybe our, some of our other panelists could talk about that, but um, there's definitely a lot to delve into on that topic. Well, one of my colleagues on the um, suffrage collection that uh, just came out a few months ago, 
Brooke Kroger, um, who teaches at NYU, wrote a book called The Suffragettes, um, playing on the notion of um, men who were agents um, and to use Carly's term, allies of the women's suffrage movement. And, and yes, it began with a men's suffrage league in New York and then quickly um, became a, a national force and had all kinds of um, powerful men, but also public intellectuals. Um, uh, John Dewey, for example, was a member of that. Um, I think uh, the women, the, the women really still deserve the credit. I think they could have accomplished this eventually without the work of the men, but there were some wealthy men who gave them money to support the cause and also who endorsed them and even sort of paved the way for some more positive press coverage in the mainstream newspapers and magazines of the day. So they, they certainly were there, at least in the last, let's say, 10 years of the suffrage movement. Okay. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, just add that um, W.E.B. Du Bois also became a really important suffrage supporter. And in 1915, uh, when he was editor of The Crisis, he uh, uh, published a forum that, that um, allowed a whole range of African-American leaders, uh, male and female, to explain why they were supporting women's suffrage. It's super interesting because of the variety of arguments that they make for women's suffrage. It's not all just one particular kind of argument. It's not, so that's a really fabulous resource, I think, um, for us to look at. But also the men from, there are actually loads of men from suffrage states out in the West who, of course, supported women's suffrage and, and would come east to make the claim that, look, you know, in Colorado and California, where women have the vote, civilization has not ended. And in fact, there have been really great results of that. People like Judge Ben Lindsay, who was a juvenile court judge in Colorado, and Ed Costigan, who was an important politician and would become an important um, New Deal senator from Colorado. Now, they're really, really important in um, making the case from the experience of working with women who are voting and had voting had voted for you know, 20 years by the time we get to the to the 19th amendment. Um, so that's another really interesting group of guys. So we have two more questions in the chat. And I guess if we're quick, uh, we can answer them. One is new one uh, from somebody he's already asked, but religion plays a big role in the issue of women's rights now. What role did religion play in connection with the suffrage movement? Um, I could just say a word about the Women's Christian Temperance Union, that which is the biggest women's organization in the late 19th century, um, and which was devoted, of course, to trying to reduce the um, uh, availability of alcohol. And that that group, very much a Christian uh, uh, identified group, um, came to support suffrage in the 1880s, 1881, as a measure toward home protection. They called it because they they thought that alcohol was. Um, a scourge for women. There was a, it was feminist in that way, their argument against alcohol that, that drunken men abused women and children. And so they wanted to reduce that. And they began to think moral suasion is not going to be enough. We need the vote if we're going to reduce the availability of alcohol. So there's one place where religion was really, um, was in, intertwined with the suffrage movement really early on. Okay, and can you speak about grass mo grassroots movements? How many generations does change take and what steps are first, second, et cetera? Directed to Jessica and Robin, but I think anybody <laughs> can answer who, who would like. Well, I mean, I think as, as Robin was pointing out and, and, and Linda, I mean, all of us have kind of, I think we can kind of put this together that the that there were there wasn't one singular suffrage movement. There were lots of movements all over the country that were happening at different times and had different agendas and were 
prioritizing different things. Um, and so to kind of see it as a univocal movement that happened at one moment or even just happened, people get confused as to when it happened um, in the 1860s, was it in the 1840s, was it in the 1920s? Um, so I think, and not seeing that it was like all of that time and before then as well. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things that's been really interesting to me that too, is that the centennial and celebrate, so celebrating the centennial has been also very grassroots. There's just so many celebrations all over the country that are really kind of shaping and casting the centennial in really interesting ways. So it's hard to identify like one particular um, way that the centennial is being memorialized, which I think is actually really exciting um, and interesting. And is I think, creating a lot of good buzz about voting and women in politics and rights restrictions and suppression and things like that, that we need to be talking about um, even in the midst of a time when we're all kind of at home. I don't know if anybody else wants to pop in. Yeah, I would just second that exactly. And I would say that the that the movement has always been a grassroots movement. That's where the the energy and action has really been, and that it has continued, it never did stop. You know, that that 1920 just opened a new um, a new chapter in the struggle for suffrage, especially among African American women in the South, for instance. I mean, African American women in the South begin badgering their local officials as well as the president and the attorney general of the United States to say, why I do I, it's the 19th amendment and the 15th amendment I know gave me the right to vote and I'm being denied that right. What are you gonna do about it? And those complaints and grassroots efforts continue from 1920 then into the 1960s and beyond as Carly has pointed out. I and mean, they, those efforts continue through the 20th century and we are still having those we are still in those fights. That struggle goes on. It will always go on. One of the lessons, if I could just have this one last thing. I mean, one of the lessons it seems to me of this history is that um, we see that having the vote doesn't mean you keep the vote. You, we actually need grassroots struggle to keep it, to retain it. Because if we didn't have time to talk about all the reversals of the vote that happened over this during this history. So this is not a given, it'll never be a given. Fighting over voting rights is endemic to American democracy. This is our struggle. It'll always be our struggle. Oh, goodness. What a note to end on <laughs> what, what we're facing. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you for everybody attending. Thank you for the people involved with setting this on. Um, appreciate it so much. As I said, certainly gives us food, food for thought and we were able to learn so much. So thank you, everybody.